Each year, worldwide, over a quarter of a million pedestrians are killed in traffic. Millions of pedestrians are maimed or injured. Join us for the next half hour as we look for solutions on perils for pedestrians. On this episode, we visit Lanier Middle School in Fairfax City, Virginia, where students are investigating the walking routes to school. Then we visit Silver Spring, Maryland, where residents of senior housing are trying to get a sidewalk and crosswalk on Norbeck Road. Finally, we look at traffic safety in Seoul, South Korea. Stay tuned. We're in Fairfax City, Virginia, talking with Faiza Alam, who's a teacher at Lanier Middle School. What's been going on this afternoon? We have eco-school program running at Lanier Middle School, and we have an eco-club that meets twice a week, and we try to connect the learning in the classroom to the real-life connection. So normally, we, the students would come out and work here in the courtyard. We have also been working on looking at the survey of the walking conditions of the neighborhood and seeing what is missing, what needs to be done so that more students can walk to school rather than having kiss and ride being so blocked in the morning. So we had a lot of students and staff and community members from the city and extended community come here and walk with us with the security of the police officer to do the walk of the area that students can walk and identify the spots that are good, what needs to be fixed so that we can make it better. What was good and what does need to be fixed? So we have sidewalks and as one of the students mentioned that as we are close to the school the sidewalks look pretty good but we go a little farther off it kind of weans off or it doesn't exist. So we were missing some sidewalks if there were they were not really in good condition and there were some missing some curbs there were some areas that was not safe a little bit and lack of lighting there was not enough crosswalk uh, maybe we need some more stop sign and some more signs for the students to walk safely. Um, so definitely there were certain things that can be fixed. And the students are busy taking notes during, yes. the, during their little yes. walkabout. So we had a bit nice plan for it. We col collaborated with the city planning office. We got the real maps and the maps were nicely color coded. So the students, we had two different teams going in two different routes to identify. And one was a note taker, one was giving comments and they were both discussing and writing down the whole route as to what where we had given them codes for different conditions good or need improvement and they were using those codes to identify that on the map and take their notings and they came back to the classroom and then we debriefed in the classroom had a reflection as a science teacher would of any data collected and um, students had very good observation that they made. Uh, we'll again debrief tomorrow as adults with the principal and the adults that were present today take all the student data and uh, at the end the students will again collaborate and combine all this data and present it to the city council and the school board to address uh, the issues. As a teacher, how do you, how do you see doing a, a practical exercise like this uh, fitting into your science curriculum? Is this a very practical way to have the students learn? Oh, you, you just hit the soft spot of my heart. I want to take my teaching beyond the four walls of classroom. That's I always wanted to do coming from India. I did not get that and I wanted to give that to my students. So anytime I get an opportunity to connect the learning to the real world, I grab that opportunity and introduce it to my students. We teach one half of the curriculum in Science 7 is about understanding our environment, how can we make it better, how can we improve, what are the dilemmas of the urban urbanization and runoff, erosion, storm management, all that kind of stuff. So what better way to connect for the students to go and see real life, what is impacting and what the future is going to look like if we don't fix this today because they will be facing the music. So educating them today is going to be making them a better citizen, better global citizen, more creative, critical thinker, uh, collaborator, communicator, you name it. You know, it's, it's just making them ready for the real life and the real world which they will have to face. Could you see on, on today's exercise that were they looking at the streets and sidewalks in a, in a different way than perhaps they, they would have yesterday? 
Absolutely, absolutely. I don't even think they would have noticed that there was a ditch or there was this or there was a curb missing or the curb was not done properly or in one section there was a sidewalk that didn't even look like a sidewalk. It was an extension of a blacktop and we had to point it to them. And then they did observe and their observations going forward was really good today. But on their own, yeah, no. They would be busy texting or just calling a friend on the cell phone while walking. Uh, so today they made real good observation which otherwise they would not have done. How do the student observations you know, today and some of the other projects you've been working on, uh, do they eventually make their way to the city of Fairfax for them to take advantage of what the young eyes see? Absolutely. All the projects the student have completed here at Lanier, they have presented it to the school board. I'll just give you an example. Uh, for the past five years, a Lanier students have been participating in caring for watershed competition at George Mason University and they've always been winners but that's not the point they always come up with a real life problem so one of the problems we had when we had renovation was a big runoff at the one of the parking lot of the Bevan and we have pictures of that student identified that on the one of the these walks that we do often and that whole area was converted into a bioretention cell where no runoff takes place now and nothing goes in and student presented that to the school board and it was very well appreciated. Another example of that is students again made a proposal of banning plastic bags and plastic bottles here and they wrote a proposal that to install fountains, bottle filling fountains at Linear and again they got all these projects are funded by grants that I write and the students obviously find the problems and they identify it and they presented it to the school board, city school board, Fairfax city school board gave some money and they also won the award from the Caring for Watershed. So based on that, we have six water fountains installed at Linear and the kids go and present all this to the school board members. And um, again, second year this year, they did a continue, continuation of that proposal and collected data to show we have installed six stations on the ground level. So they gave a data of how much plastic bottles were saved in the lower level of the school versus the upper level where there is no machine right now. So they gave that data and they again won a place to, with the funding, to install water fountains on the upper level. So, you know, they identify the problem, they present it, they write proposals, they do it 100% their way and, you know, it's, it's just perfect. It's just perfect. And this project itself will be going to the city school board and the city council and the students will present it. I will not be in the picture. We're in Fairfax City talking with Aaron Lennart, who's principal of Linear Middle School. What did you just spend the last hour doing? Um, well, we've been sitting in a meeting um, regarding safe routes to schools. Uh, and the work of several of our students and teacher leaders and people in our Fairfax City community around um, around bettering the commute for students to come to Lanier, particularly those who are walkers. Um, we had a number of students who a couple days ago went out and they were escorted by police officers, a um, number of staff members, and they um, went out um, within a mile or so radius of the school. So when the kids went out, uh you walk in the neighborhood, what sort of things were they looking for? They were looking for hazards and potential hazards for students, for any walkers, um, whether they be students actually or any of the pedestrians around Lanier Middle School in their journey to school. So what, uh, what happens next? Uh, students uh, you know, did this as a class project, uh, identified some possible hazards, you know, some good things, but some possible hazards as well. Uh, how does that get to the people who can make a difference? What I really love about this project, I think, is that it transcends the classroom. This was a, a club that we have after school that did the work and did all the legwork, no pun intended, if you will, and went out into the community. So next steps are we're going to take all the data. Uh, they, had a, uh, they were looking at a map when they walked around, and they also had a spreadsheet that they were filling out as they identified potential hazards um, to a safe route to school. Um, those students will come together. They will synthesize the data, if you will, and then they're going to create a presentation that they will present to hopefully um, both our city school board and our city council. Now what can what the can the school system you know use the principal and the school board and the school system do and what do you depend on the city or the county to accomplish? 
Um, I think for us it's really just um, giving students the opportunity, first of all, to advocate for themselves, advocate for the school, advocate for um, what they believe should be a safe journey and path to school. So giving them a platform and an opportunity to do, this, do that if they um, if they're interested and if they're passionate about it. I mean, our students are our future residents, our future taxpayers. Um, a lot of them will remain in the community, so giving them that opportunity. Um, so for the school, I think providing multiple opportunities for students to find causes, um, reasons to make a difference in the community, and supporting those efforts as students um, go out um, and find projects and ways to better, um, better the community at large. Um, as far as, as the city piece or the county piece and what I believe they can do is listen um, and listen with open ears. I often say it's out of the mouths of babes um, that we get some of our best ideas and some of our um, best lessons in life because um, a lot of the reflective pieces that I know that the students will bring to the table and have brought to the table in various projects around Lanier Middle School and at other schools in the county have been um, game changers, if you will, uh, and um, um, projects, community service opportunities that a lot of adults aren't thinking about and processing. So um, for the county to listen, um, to, to listen with an open heart and open mind, for the city to do the same, and if there is a solution that can be worked out, um, to partner with the students, to partner with the community, um, to try to actually implement some of those solutions. We're on Norbeck Road in Silver Spring, talking with Millie Ryan. What's been going on here this afternoon? Well, we just completed our march, asking for our sidewalks, our lights, and our flashes that we've never had since we've been here. So it means that we have not been able to access ourselves across the street. What's across the street that you might want to try to get to? Well, we would like, some of us would like to go to the bus stop. Some of us like to go to the store. Some of us would like to go to the park. And we can't do any of those because we all are seniors. And seniors have a hard time because the traffic is so busy. This is light today, but it's usually too busy for you to even walk out there. How long have you been trying to get the, the county to do something about a sidewalk? Well, we have been trying. I came in 2008, so I have been trying since then. But others have been trying prior to that. In fact, we have a letter that came back from 2011 saying that we were going to have sidewalks, but we don't have them. We have lots of letters like that. <laughs> so so the, the county says it's willing to build a sidewalk, but they, they just haven't done it they yet. They haven't done it. Every time it comes with a different story, they don't have the money. But you know, it, bu it bugs me because Montgomery County is the richest state in the nation. And when you tell me you don't have money, that bothers me a lot because we can do so many other things, but we are the seniors and we have paved the way for everyone else. We have built the bridges so you could walk under them. And now we are trying to make it off our little social security checks and everything and still don't have, you know, have the means of being happy because we are confined to our area. So, have you had any reaction today? Are you hearing anything from, uh, from the government officials over here? We have the Senator Mano is here and Senator Kramer and a few others, other constituents and some of the other liaisons. We're glad to see them, but we want more than talk. We want action because we don't have to vote. We don't have to do anything. If we don't get what we need, why should we be involved in what's going on? And what we're going to do, though, really, is walk every month until we get sidewalks. So they're going to have to stop the traffic for us until we get some sidewalk, some lights, and everything else that belongs to us. How's that going to impact the quality of life for the people living here when you finally do get those sidewalks? <laughs> How would it impact us? Yeah. We can get together. <laughs> We can be closer because we can come together. Right now, it's, it's a community working together. You know, 
and that makes us closer together and we can do things more as a community because it takes a village to raise a family and it takes all of us working together as one common unit to do anything. And I'm, I'm really excited at what happened today, you know, at the outcome and the people from all different, you know, developments, right, in this little area. And I think we accomplished something because I see now that a few blocks up the street, they're beginning to do something on the road. Why did they decide to do it today? <laughs> We're talking to State Senator Roger Mano. Why were you here at the protest this afternoon? Well, uh, I represent this area in the State Senate, and I spend a lot of time at Hampshire Village and at Leisure World. Uh, and it's if, to anybody in the community who understands the situation here on Norbeck Road, they will, they'll know that it's a treacherous stretch of road on a good day. And if you're a pedestrian and you'd like to cross over to that beautiful park, Bradford Park, that overlooks the ICC, you just can't do it. You're taking your life in your hands if you're a pedestrian. You literally need to drive across the road. So today, Ben Kramer and I and Bonnie Cullison and Marce Morales organized a walk. We literally walked across about 100 of us uh, to the park. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the assistance of the park police and the county police, uh, but we were able to do it we, with minimal disruption of traffic. We stopped traffic twice for about five or ten minutes uh, in order to articulate the point of how difficult it is to cross over to that beautiful park that we just built. So I'm here to, uh, to fly the flag for our great uh, county and our great district and to uh, hopefully uh, continue to work with State Highway to get some sidewalks and a crosswalk. Do you hear about uh, pedestrian issues uh, like missing sidewalks and so on yeah. uh, a lot from your constituents? We do. And, you know, with the pace of development, uh, we got to be careful that what's not lost is the needs of pedestrians and folks who are on bicycles, bicyclists, uh, folks who are, you know, just trying to exercise, maybe jog, some with baby carriages. And there are large areas in our county that still haven't caught up with the pace of development and uh, or have developed without uh, taking into consideration pedestrian and bicyclist, bicyclist needs. So we're trying to play catch up here. This is an area uh, that's been somewhat developed. Uh, it's a little bit unplanned. Uh, but it's, uh, there's a, an awful lot of folks in the area. And what we're seeing is a place like Hampshire Village essentially landlocked. Uh, if these folks want to go to Leisure World or go to Bradford Park or go to Georgia Avenue and go shopping, they can't do it without taking uh, a vehicle. So uh, we're trying to, as I said before, work with the, the state, uh, state highway, in this case using their maintenance budget, I believe, to be able to implement some traffic calming and pedestrian safety measures, um, a sidewalk from from uh, from Hampshire Village to Bailey's Lane, which is just to the east of us, probably a couple of hundred feet, and then a crosswalk over to Bradford Park. Uh, there is this service road right here going, uh, for folks who can't see, going from uh, Hampshire Village to Leisure World, uh, that could address the pedestrian needs from, from that stretch to, to here. And then for the final stretch, again, Hampshire Village to Bailey's Lane, we need a sidewalk. And then this is the state road. Uh, how do things work? Uh, you have the county, you have the state. Yep. Uh, you know, who's responsible for sidewalks and, 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 and where are there policy issues that Dep need to be addressed? Depends on where it is. Uh, this uh, Norbeck Road is a state road. So the jurisdiction here is State Highway, uh, State Highway Administration, SHA. Uh, and uh, we work, I'm on the Budget Committee, we work very closely with them. Uh, I think they understand the needs of this community. Uh, and folks who are watching on television today will, will see 100 seniors crossing Norbeck Road. Uh, and so the state, I think, is getting the point. I think our county council understands the need. We're, we're very blessed to have uh, representatives from the county council and the, and the, the county here today. Uh, so we've got state, local, House of Delegates, state senate, county council, county executive's office. Uh, we're, we're all on board and trying to get uh, some reasonable uh, measures to safety measures and quality of life measures so folks can, you know, uh, 
use uh, our wonderful facilities uh, without having to take their lives in their hands. We're talking with Maryland State Delegate Ben Kramer. What brought you here this afternoon? Well, it's important that we begin to address the concerns of the community here with regard to the fact that we have got a very busy, oversubscribed roadway and absolutely nothing in place to allow the pedestrians, particularly the senior pedestrians that live in this community, and give them access to anything along this road, especially the new community park that's been built across the street. There's no sidewalks in place. This is completely pedestrian unfriendly and very short-sighted to be quite frank about it in the fact that it has been developed in the nature that it has without providing any accessibility for pedestrians through here and we have this one particular example we've been looking at today are there broader policy implications that this brings up that uh, you know so this situation doesn't happen you know elsewhere in the county and elsewhere in the state well I think anytime we're looking at planning communities and development anywhere in the county we need to as a priority and as a prominent piece of the decision making how are we going to get our pedestrians from point A to point B? How are we going to facilitate that movement as well as the automobile traffic? We can't just be looking at the automobiles without taking into consideration to the same level of concern and interest our pedestrian movement. And I think that is the primary concern every time we look at any kind of development or projects here in the county. What are we going to do to facilitate that pedestrian movement and interaction with the broader communities around it? And that's uh, key to everything we should be doing here. And clearly, it was very short-sighted because now we've got a road that, again, is oversubscribed. There's more traffic than was ever envisioned to be on this little two-lane road and nothing in place to help our pedestrians, particularly our senior community that's right here. We're talking with Lester Brown. How long have you been working on trying to get a sidewalk here? I've been living here 12 years. We moved in here when the building was first built, brand almost new. And we had been working on Norback Road about 10 years. The traffic, I have seen the traffic increase over the years. And like, especially in the rush hours, it is really bad out here. Now, we got a letter from Roger Mano back in 2011 that was supposed to have been something done here. But what happened, Homecrest Road got fixed, Connecticut Avenue got fixed, they all got crosswalks, but we don't have them. Now I'm wondering how much does it cost to fix a crosswalk? It looks simple to me. If I had the bricks and the mortar, I could do it myself, <laughs> you know? But this, this little walk we had today, I hope will open somebody's eyes that we are serious about what we're doing. We really need this. Thank you. We're in Seoul talking with David Kilburn. What's this intersection behind us? It's a perfectly regular Seoul intersection on Bukchon Road, one of the main roads in this part of Seoul. What happened here back in March? And my wife and I were crossing the road on a pedestrian crossing when suddenly, uh, unbeknown to us, a car behind us, a taxi, made an illegal turn and drove straight into us from the back. Uh, the first I was knew about it was when we were hurled across the road. How did the police react to an incident like that? Well, Seoul has the highest number of pedestrian accidents of any OECD country. So it was a perfectly routine accident from their point of view. It so happened there was a police car parked on the other side of the street. And so the entire event was witnessed by the police, who must have known exactly what to do next. Uh, it was also recorded on the car's um, um, webcam. Most taxis in, in, in Korea have a video recorder simply to record accidents that may or may not take place. Um, 
it was the police who uh, called an ambulance and arranged for us to be taken off to hospital. And you mentioned Korea's dubious distinction of you know number of crashes for an OECD member. Uh, what what contributes to the high crash rate here in Korea? Koreans have a very aggressive driving attitude. They have often been taught by a driving by a driving instructor who was previously a heavy goods driver in the army. So the idea that uh, you have right of way and people will get out of your way uh, is pervasive. Secondly, people feel they are in a tremendous hurry to get from A to B. And so they will jump lights, make illegal turns, do whatever they feel is going to increase their odds of getting to their destination a minute or so earlier. Um, the casualties in all this are pedestrians. Even when you're crossing the road on a pedestrian crossing, you need to keep your eyes open or wits about you. Um, drivers don't necessarily see a green pedestrian light as indicating they should do anything but be feel aware there's a pedestrian there. I've been crossing pedestrian crossings in Seoul and suddenly a large coach drives past directly in front of me. Green lights for the pedestrian is still on, but the coach driver feels they don't concern him. So that leads to um, circumstances where accidents are a little more likely to happen. Another feature that was important in this case was the uh, pedestrian control lights were switched off. The local authority field is very important to save electricity and so um, they must have some idea that uh, a certain number of accidents are are allowable if you're saving electricity. What sort of campaign would it take to, to get safety to, to be more of a priority here in Korea? Is it, what, what, what could happen? See, safety is an issue not only in driving, it's an issue in factories, it's an issue in transportation. Uh, an issue in the construction industry. Uh, Korea is not a country that is safety conscious. The additional costs involved in making workplaces safe and so on often deemed not worth taking. And so it's inherently less safe than it need be and less safe than a com uh, comparable situation would be in Europe or the USA. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.